we're in the process now of tensioning in the membrane, finally. And there's probably about a meter and a half or so to pull in further. So the form's going to get really tight. And that's really important because what it does is define the form and make it into an object, which I think is important. We've got three and a half days to go, and um, I hope we'll get there. Well, I know we'll get there. At the end of 2001, Anish Kapoor was commissioned to create a new sculpture for the Unilever series in the Turbine Hall at Tate Modern, London. This film follows the making of the commission. I have an instinct that it's going to come together. Um, I do not have a certainty that it's going to come together. Um, that's the risk one takes, I think, in making a project of this nature. In a sense, that's what we do as artists. We conduct our, our education in public. And in the end, it is the problem. How does one take a series of processes, big, small, or otherwise, and precipitate them in a space in such a way that what's there is more than the result of those processes. And what's more is mythological, psychological, spiritual, if you like. Much of my work comes out of the deep belief that form has metaphysical memory, that it isn't just about what you see, that there's something of a kind of bodily recall which relates to a series of ideas, abstract ideas, and therefore it's abstract art. I was asked to do, to take on the Turbine Hall in, I think, December last year. I must admit, not something I hadn't thought about, um, but one never thinks about a space seriously until um, um, one's faced, so to speak, with the problem of it. And it's quite a problem. While it has this vast length, it also has a very substantial verticality. So it made one decision really obvious that what I've got to do is deal with the whole space. So the initial idea as proposed in this model was um, to start, well, by building a wall, um, um, cutting the space diagonally like this, which allows one to, to um, here work with a very simple geometric form, the circle, and then um, in a way through the vehicle of this sort of pipe, have the form grow and change into a different form. So at the end, it's a rectangle, which you know, reflects the space and so on. But I felt that somehow it ignores the question of this platform, of this bridge. Um, what interests me is the scale. So um, this circle here is about 28 meters or so. And just that sense of a monochrome at that scale felt as if, yeah. There's something to work with here. But this progression, this progression from circle to rectangle, is something that came out of one of the first things I ever made as an artist, um, um, some almost 30 years ago now, which maybe we should go and look at mm. upstairs. <laughs> This is a drawing I did, I think, in 1973 or 74, 74 probably, um, in which it's a very simple idea. Um, I asked a, a computer to change a circle into a square. What interests me about it is that I determined the two ends, and in a sense, the computer imagined the rest. I think I like that idea as a model, as a model for a way to think. That in fact, you know, you set up the ends and the form in between is at one level logical and another level, I like it 
the idea of it being sort of imaginary. Once I'd made the decision to deal with the whole space, certain obvious things become problems to be solved or whatever. The most obvious problem is the problem of the platform. So in this proposal, what I did was to suggest, if you like, two vast sort of negative monochromes. And the idea is that the building, of course, this is all tightly wedged into the building. So as one enters the door there, one's in the negative space, and then you negotiate a way round where the form becomes a positive form, and then up and through, through and up the platform onto, the, onto this level, um, and then there's, these, there's this kind of double negative, so double monochrome. It has that feeling of a, the vastness of space. There's this one here, which is slightly wacky, but I think nonetheless interesting, using the platform as a staging post, if you like, for this object that's way too big for the space, like a huge beached whale. The notion here was, again, of this spinal link between the two ends, made in some kind of mirrored material, where the kind of interior that I've been trying to engage with earlier proposals is implied by this space between the platform and, um, um, and the f this hanging object. Um, you know, various thoughts about how it might be made. Could it be solid? Could we cast it in concrete? And with engineers exploring the reality of such notions in a given budget and in a given time. The idea here is to keep the creative flow going as long as possible and to get practical only when it's absolutely necessary. You know, I don't want to take on all that stuff. I don't want to deal with catering. Yet somehow the project has to deal with it. One can have a hundred different ideas about a space, but it's not the ideas that matter. I think it's to do with how one deals with the very simple, almost pragmatic problems that are set up by the architecture and how one overcomes them and yet holds on to one's, so to speak, artistic project. Overarup engineers and myself have agreed that we can make a structure like this. The notion is to have three steel rings defining the ends of the object, which are about half a meter or so in diameter. And uh, in the case of this one, almost 30 meters round, wedged into the building, so really forced between the walls. And then to have a fabric structure, I say fabric, it's actually PVC um, stretched between the two ends with the third ring floating off the platform at a height of about 2.3 meters. So, you know, just, just above, above reach. There's nothing else holding it up. Nothing other than really these two rings wedged into the building that are holding it up. The third ring, of course, is hanging off those two rings. So we've got about sort of, I don't know, 35 to 40 tons of steel here. The engineers that I've been working with have a great long history in this kind of structure and they tell me it's going to stand up, so I believe it's going to stand up. I mean, if you only started working on these um, last here last Thursday, last Thursday, last th that's extraordinary. The thing with a project like this is there's a non-movable end date. That's it. It's got to open on that day. The invites are gone out. <laughs>
what I've found from this is that by the sophistication of contemporary computer programming and the way that Arabs have managed to use that information has allowed us to make a form that um, has a complete flow to it. So um, it's, it's that. It's you know, how do you cut um, whatever it is, 17,000 meters of, of material, in order to make sure that the seams, the tailorings in the right way, the patterns are correct. It can be done without computers, but I'm sure without the same flow of form. I don't think any such structure has ever been built. Um, I think it's probably the, l I'm told anyway, <laughs> the longest structure of its kind ever attempted. But I mean, anyway, who cares? What's important to me though is that the engineering needs to be a ghost. Invisible but indivisible from what one's looking at. And I think there is a tension in that which is really very interesting. On the face of it, there is not much that continues through from this work or the works I've been making over the last few years to the pigment pieces that I made some 20 years ago. But I think that's only on the face of it. The deeper content, the idea, for example, that color materializes and dematerializes an object is uh, an abiding concern. The idea that the object is a kind of protrusion, if you like, into the space, rather like an iceberg. Most of its body is below the ground or behind the wall or in a way unspoken. In a different sort of way, the notion about the wholeness of an object, mostly implied, but this idea of an object indicating, if you like, a kind of totalness, having a gestalt of its own, is something I've always believed is very important. So there are a number of thematic things that, of course, um, carry through. I try to, at one level, yes, I do, I try to make something every day. I find that important, that one doesn't sit down and have a good idea and then go out there and perform it. Pointless. Um, ideas, metaphors, uh, things spiritual or real occur out of practice. Go in there every day, make something, and, and something will flow out of that. So studio is very, very important to me. I just want to draw a box on it. Okay. Sculpture is a long process. So I feel that it's necessary, since I can't attend to all of the things that I would like to attend to all of the time, to work with other people. I have a, a very wonderful set of people who work with me. And the length of the process is such that it's just necessary um, to, um, for example, if one's working in stone, um, I'm not actually not a very good stone carver. I think I could probably hold a form, but it would take me months. Um, I haven't got months. I feel that most of the roughing out, most of the work of getting towards the form can be done by other people, and uh, so it is done by other people. And together, we work towards a final product. The modern sculptor, or the contemporary sculptor, one should say, has available many, many different materials. Um, traditional materials, which have their resonance and power, like stone and the various cast metals, etc. And then contemporary materials, which do something very different. 
plastic holds colour in a very astonishing, deep way that I've always been interested to try and work with. It also holds form in a very beautiful way, in a very natural sort of uh, flowing way. The materials need to flow with, or go with, the ideas that one's trying to work with. So I've you know, worked with various cast plastics and then pigment and earth and stone and so on. They're really to do with whatever it is that I'm trying to pursue as a, as a notion. Most of those notions are to do at one level with the presence and the fact of material. Even pigment has a material factness to it, stuffness to it. And then for me this, this continual obsession with the idea that the material somehow always leads to something immaterial. I see that as a fundamental, contradictory, yet complementary in some way, condition of the material world. I'm interested in the idea that form, colour can have psychological, physiological, historical memory, that it can push the viewer away from the way the thing is made towards something else. I think it's the job of an artist to make that stuff work. Um, the rest is construction. I have a great problem with public sculpture. Um, public sculpture is something that doesn't easily work. It doesn't easily work, in my opinion, because, in a sense, the philosophical reasons for it being out in the public are eroded. So the work needs to re-establish you know, why it's out there. There's no point plonking a thing in front of a office building or whatever it is. This is it's purposeless. And the way that a work creates its own space in which it demands to be viewed is most important. The square in front of the Notting Playhouse is a difficult space, to put it mildly. While the circular communal garden or whatever it is in the middle of the square has a classical beauty, everything on the edge of it is um, seemingly thrown together, too much concrete and, and not enough spirit uh, in one way or the other. So, a very difficult thing to do. And I wondered if it was possible with that project to propose a sculpture, but in fact to try and make a painting. It's a simple scientific, if you like, object. Um, it's hardly a sculpture at all. And what it does is take the image of the buildings around, draw in the image of the clouds, which of course are wonderfully changing all the time, turn them upside down and kind of deliver them to ground, almost like a television screen. There's something un uncanny about it. There's something that seems um, slightly unreal about the spatial problems that occur in the concave surface and then this projected image, or what appears to be a projected image. Tarantantara, which is the piece I made at the Baltic Flour Mills, was a project that I did quite quickly when I was invited to make something there in the shell of the building. The idea was to see if it was possible to think of architecture as being, if you like, a discrete object. We plonk buildings down in a sense and they aren't joined up to what's around them. To take that as a given and then see if it's possible in fact to turn this building into a, an object. And I, I wanted to do that by thinking about turning the building inside out. So quite different from, from Marcius here, um, Tarantantara was actually 
physically joined up to the two ends of the, of the building. And I think quite literally did turn the building inside out. It, it pushed the space of the exterior through the building by virtue of a very organic form, seemingly shortening the perspective between the two ends of the building. And then from the outside of the building, um, what one looked at was the inside of the form. And from the inside of the building, a kind of reversal happened, and you're looking at the outside of the form. So um, that juxtaposition seemed, seemed important. I've tried to bring that here, in a way. Um, but one never knows. I don't know if it's going to work or not. I don't, know, I don't think it's going to be the same kind of thing. This, this work here, Marcius, is a defined object. It's an object that's a little too big for this space, kind of squeezed into this space. It'll do very different things. The process is a slightly complex one in that one can throw oneself into the scale of the model and try and get a picture of, of what it's going to be like. Then when, of course, the things come into the space, there is just no accounting for that scale. It has a voice of its own. The elegance of the drawing in space dissolves. It's got to be somehow replaced by mass and form and volume. So the clarity of the three rings was very nice to see, like three drawings in the space. Simple, clear, almost there as a work in a sense um, already. And then the very difficult thing of, uh, so to speak, in fleshing the work. Um, I know from my work in the studio that that's the most difficult part. is attempting to make a shift from some kind of mountain of colour, um, the facade, which is you know, up there and vast, and then the way that it seems to introduce the human or reintroduce the human as you go up onto the bridge and then you're inside the belly of the thing. That shift, if you like, from big to intimate is, yeah, I think it's beginning to happen as the piece comes together. My biggest concern over the last few days is whether the temporary nature of this thing, temporary I mean by that, um, that rather like this chair, the, 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 the fabric is stretched across a given structure, and whether that tent-making procedure can have real presence in the space and not just be a bit of you know, more or less interesting ephemera. Now, there's a difficult thing there between a very real scale and a method of form making that's somewhat tentative in some way. And how, how does one get real presence? If one's talking about a sense in which all is about fear and vertigo and being confronted by something which one immediately has to recognize is bigger than one's self or bigger than one's perhaps imagined self even, then that's one of the things that this work is moving towards. And monochrome color, I think, is very good at that, very good at confronting the viewer with a kind of unexpected. We all know about red, but I, but I bet we've never seen it like that. It, 
it isn't an easy object to, to, to grasp. I'm quite concerned that as one walks through it that one has to do a bit of mental manipulation, if you like, in order to understand how it is that the whole thing comes together. How do the forms relate to each other? In a sense, there are three discrete moments or three discrete forms that are linked by these long bridges, pipes. And that moment, from going from a flat to a, um, a horizontal to the vertical again, as one walks through it, one has to configure a mental picture. The form is always moving from positive to negative. So the form is always revealing itself, but then always masking itself. I have given the, the work a name. Um, it's called Marcius, after the rather intense Greek myth which talks of the satyr Marcius and his flaying by the god Apollo. Of course, there's the very great late Titian work on this subject. I'm interested in it, of course, because the work is a skin. This, this work out here is a skin. And it, in a sense, by virtue of its color and the sort of material it is, is flayed, it's stretched, it's pulled over this form, or the form emerges out of the pulling between the, the three rings. In a work of this scale, the hard thing is, I think, to try and hold on to the mysterious, to hold on to something that remains unanswerable. And that has to do, I'm sure, with two things, the form, but also to do with the content. Um, I may point to Marcius, I may point towards um, some kind of designated content. At one level, it's true, it's there. At another level, it's irrelevant. It's perhaps just as much to do with the vibrancy of the color, the nature of the construction, the, the way the thing is fastened and stretched and pulled, the volume, etc. You know, when you make a, a daft object of this scale, it's hard enough to get this far, to get it into the space, put it up, and, and, and so on and so forth. I have no idea what's going to happen to it after the show. Um, it's, I hope, will have another life. But I have some vague notions that if it doesn't have another life, um, I may use it as a mold um, to make another work. So we'll see. I hope it'll continue and lead me into something else. Thank you.